us to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look again at this passage in verses 2 through 16. I told you last week when we began looking at this, it's uh, my Greek professor in seminary, Dr. Curtis Vaughn, who was incredibly skilled in the uh, study of the Greek New Testament. In fact, who, who trained my mentor, R.F. Gates, who also was incredibly skilled in the Greek New Testament, said in, in the course of our studying in seminary, that this passage uh, in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth is one of the most difficult to understand because he's bringing historically, theologically, eternally relevant issues into a culture that has cultural expressions of it. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge. So we began looking last week at... at Biblical manhood and womanhood, certainly a, a timely topic to study. Since we live in a culture that would have us believe that that's just old hat, that the notion, uh, I mean, just if you read the papers, watch the news, it's just, you, you, surely your jaw just drops from time to time. Driver's licenses in places out on the West Coast have now have male, female, other uh, to identify yourself. You've, you've got universities where, where people get in trouble if they use the pronoun he or she, referencing a person who has said, I don't want to be identified as he or she. Call me, call me Z. I mean, it's just, it's, I, I wrote someone, are you familiar with, with Alice in Wonderland? Are you familiar with that book? When they go down the rabbit hole? Folks, we've gone down the rabbit hole. But there's a word that even in the rabbit hole, <laughs> the people of God can have a, have a clarity and a certainty and a conviction. And this passage is going to help us with that, I believe. So turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, read verses 2 to 16. I hope you found that in your Bible. If not, we've got it on the screen for you, but I really want you to have your own Bible. Now, if you just left it at home, get a better habit than that. But if you don't have one, talk to us. We want, we want you to have, have your own copy of the Scripture. Stand with me, if you would, and follow along as I, uh, I read. I said someone years ago, I think I was teaching our young people, I said, did you bring your Bible today? Well, I said, would you go hunting without a weapon? Would you get into a deer blind and go, dang, gummy? Got my gun. No, you. If you're going out hunting, you you know you got to have it's better habits, better habits. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was a man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice nor do the churches of God. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God, and, and we need help. We need help understanding this. 
We need help applying this, and we need help withstanding the absolute, all-out, unfettered assault upon the sovereign authority of the Creator who in the beginning made them male and female. Thank you. Please be seated. As I told you last week, in the sections we've studied up until this point in 1 Corinthians, Paul has dealt with, with matters of personal morality and behavior. Schisms. Remember, in the, he wasn't happy at all when he's writing that they're picking their favorite preacher and undermining the, the cohesiveness and the unity and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's, he's not happy that they are turning a, a blind eye and a deaf ear to immorality within their midst. He's not happy that they're taking one another to court. He's not happy that they're misunderstanding marriage and divorce and remarriage. And, and so we, he, he's not happy with the way they're abusing Christian liberty or superimposing a legalistic standard on others. And he's addressed these things in chapter 1 all the way through chapter, uh, the end of chapter 10, even chapter 11, verse 1. Now, though, he shifts emphasis a little. Christian liberty is still operating in the background, okay? To give directions concerning the worship of the church as a body. He's concerned that the women of Corinth not express their new freedom in Christ by flouting cherished customs that reflect God's order. And so, let's look at this. There's cultural issues operating in the background. I don't know if you've read, read writers, uh, folks who write commentaries who've said, now, this was all about culture, so it doesn't apply today. But you can't say that about this. So you, you acknowledge Paul is addressing things that were common in the Corinthian culture. We're going to look at that. But he's making an application based upon creation history and God's sovereign order in creation. See, that doesn't pass away. And what's happened in our day is that the church has gone soft on creation history. You should have known it. We should have known it that when Darwin wrote his theses, which, by the way, toward the end of his life, he kind of went, hmm, I wonder. But people didn't catch that part of it. They just took it as law, as if, as if Darwin had chiseled something in stone and brought it down from another holy mountain and it became, evolution became the law. It's a religion. Evolution is a religion. A belief in that. We should have known. We should have spotted it. It should have had the sniff of sulfur about it, just like in the garden when the devil said, has God really said? And that's what evolution did. Did God really create? And the whole time, folks, it was nothing more or less than a satanic assault on the authority of God as creator and the historical reality of creation. That's all it's ever been about. Because if you can destroy the historical reality of creation, then there goes the reality of deity. Let us make man in our image. There goes the reality of the, of the notion that a man has a, has a soul that will never die. We have eternal souls. We're eternal beings. That there's any distinction. And so the Darwinists have taken a good run at it, and sadly they've had some casualties among, among so-called Christians who want to try to make peace with them. But now it's the turn for the whole gender identity crowd to take an assault approach on the Creator and His creation. Corinth had its issues. The women in Corinth, who were part of the temple worship, the temple prostitutes, took on a certain look about them. One of them was that they they shaved their heads. Now, if you know Jewish history, if you go back and read in Deuteronomy, you know that in the Old Testament, a woman, one of the expressions of a woman who was in mourning could be that she shaved her head. So in the Jewish community, if you saw a woman with a shaved head, you know that she was grieving. 
In the Corinthian culture, if you saw a woman with a shaved head, you knew that in all likelihood she was one of the temple prostitutes. And they made a living doing that. And it was a, it was a fine living for folks. And so they would, they would flaunt this. Now, you, you don't have to have much of an imagination to imagine that when Paul came to Corinth and preached the gospel, that there were all kinds of people who were brought savingly to Christ. And no doubt, among them were some of these women who had been rescued from the, from the bondage and tragedy that was their lives. And so Paul seems to be answering some questions here. How does someone who's come out of that culture, where there was a sort of a brazenness, if you went into the pagan temple worship, a brazenness of the women, how do they then adapt in the context of worship in the Christian church? It, it is about dress, but it's, it's, not, it's not exclusively about dress. It's about symbol. It's about representation. And the challenge of studying this passage is that we don't, we don't wear veils. Now, I, I commend and appreciate those, those religious connections where, where a woman will wear a, some, something called a doily on, her, on the top of her head or who may wear a scarf over her head. I, I appreciate the, the struggle that they're that they're wrestling with to try to be faithful. Well, folks, let me give you, how do we see this today? It is symbol. How do you know that a woman is married today? If you see her in this setting, how do you know a woman's married today? Well, a couple things, probably sitting with her husband if she's married, and unless he's doing our, our security detail, uh, or unless she's in the, in the nursery preschool area, or he's, Probably sitting with the spouse. I'll tell you one thing you know. Probably wearing wedding rings, another identity. Uh, the way that this woman conducts herself around her husband and other men. There are, there are symbolic expressions that let us know. Well, how do you know a woman's unmarried? Well, then you, then you get into the whole issue of single, um, divorced, widowed. But for the single young woman, she needs to recognize that her, her demonstration needs to be that she is a young woman under the authority of her dad, her mom, of her parents. And those things are not so easily identified. You could identify veils that way, by the way. If you lived in the culture we're talking about in, in the first century, particularly in a Jewish setting, you would recognize by a person's veil whether that were, whether you were looking at a single young woman or a married young woman, married, but by the, by the way the veil was cast. So those were powerful symbols. We don't have those powerful symbols today. And I please don't walk out of here and let the devil say, you know, we know where he's going with this. You know where he's going. Burkas. No, I'm not going to Burkas. All right, that's not where we're heading. We've got, we got to wrestle with this passage, though, and understand that there's, there's powerful symbol. By the way, have any of you ever seen the Burka cam? You ever seen that? Somebody, one of our missionaries overseas sent me one. Somebody, one of our missionaries put a burqa on and had a little GoPro and just walked around with it and showed what, what you see through that mesh. You need, just do a search, Google search, burqa cam, okay? Look at it. It's scary. But we've got to come to some biblical standard here of what do we learn from Paul Some of the commentators said the covering for the head in this passage should be understood as a head covering concealing the hair and upper part of the body, but not as a covering for the face. Another commentator observed that Jewish men, then as now, Orthodox Jewish men, pray with their heads covered, which is the exact opposite of what Paul says here. Greek men and women pray with their heads uncovered. And in Rome, Roman men appear to have prayed with their heads covered. So it's, you've got this all over the map cultural stuff. And Paul's trying to come in and say, there is a Christian way to address this, primarily in the church. So that, we're going to be looking next at the, at the discussion of, of uh, Lord's Supper and, and the 
remarkable charismatic gifts as we move into 1 Corinthians. And Paul's writing to the church to say, when, when the unbelievers come among you, what do they see? What do they hear? What do they observe? And so he's getting them ready for this, of how they conduct themselves, having come from pagan cultures into the Christian environment. How do they do that? Paul feels it necessary to define a strictly Christian practice. So he appeals to the relative status of men and women in cre the created order. We're going to get to that. Suggesting that woman's creation from man implies her submission to him. Even though man and woman are one in Christ, Galatians 3.28, and spiritually equal, the distinction given in creation is not annulled. And that's what, you're, what we're trying to balance here. Suggest that women should wear a, a covering as a symbol of subordination. Think symbol to the husband and a symbol of modesty. The Lord help us then to maneuver through these rocks. I've, I've read all kinds of, I was teaching in a church years ago. And young people came to me after Sunday school one Sunday morning and said, uh, Brother Bill, is it true that that uh, Adam was made in the image of God but Eve was not and I said where did you get that well Mr. Bubba just, and that was, I'm not lying Mr. Bubba just taught us that, I said no that's not true what he was doing was taking this passage and twisting it to say what it doesn't say okay same church fellow teaching one of the older classes, a woman came to me and said, well, I, I learned that if, if Paul could have anticipated the women's liberation movement, he never would have written some of the things he wrote. Where did you hear that? Well, my Sunday school teacher told me. There's been a lot of abuse of this passage. Lord, help us. Help us. So I want us to see today Try to see these, these seven things that Paul touches on in this passage. First, there's a statement of praise. Then the principle of subordination. Then the conclusions based on women's subordination. The support for the principle of subordination. I've taken this outline, by the way, right from Dr. Curtis Vaughn's commentary because I couldn't come up with anything better. A caution concerning a wrong conclusion <clears throat> and an appeal to their sense of propriety. And then finally, this appeal to the custom of the churches. So let's just let's start unpacking this, see how far we get today. The statement of praise. Now, I commend you. So before he corrects them, he's giving a commendation. This is good practice, by the way. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. I mentioned last week that this, this tradition is not for Paul. We've, we've always done it that way because you can't say that about what Paul's doing in planting Christian churches. They haven't always done anything that they're doing in the Christian church. What he's saying is that, the, that, that he's laid down some principles based upon the, the Old Testament drawing Jesus Christ because you see Christ in the Old Testament and, and laid them down for new works for Paul, at least, primarily in non-Jewish areas, Gentile-dominated areas. I commend you, he says. So there's, he begins with this, with this statement of praise. These traditions were handed down orally uh, from, from him to them. They've not been codified in, his, in, in, the, in, the, in the body of New Testament letters or the gospel accounts yet. But they're basic facts of the gospel and then some application of how you live in the light of the gospel. The second thing we see here is this principle of subordination. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. And so he, we, we showed this to you last week. In fact, I think we've got the slides to, to give it again. Look at this. I want you to listen to it read, but watch this. The head of every man is Christ. So you got the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. And we showed you last week that when you, 
if you read this, and there's some women, bless their hearts, who read this and they just say, well, we're just second-class citizens. No, that can't possibly be true. And the Holy Spirit of God led Paul to say this in the order he did so that you would know it's not possible that a woman is inferior in the, in the Christian structure. If that's true, then Jesus Christ is inferior to God. And you know good and well the Scripture doesn't teach that. It is in the role relationships that God has established in society to demonstrate his order as sovereign creator and as merciful redeemer. And so you look at that and listen to this verse. The head of every man is Christ. Men, if you're not living for Jesus Christ, and any man you know who is not living for Jesus Christ is, is, has declared war on his head. It doesn't say the head, you, well, you think the head of every Christian man. No. We just read in Colossians. He is the head of all things. He's the one who was assigned by God to make all things. Every man needs to come to a point in his life from time to time where he stops and goes, I just did this by permission of the one who made me. And he's able to stop that at any moment that he desires to. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the wife is her husband. Okay. And then the head... Christ is God. And the Trinity, co-equal, co-eternal, co-essential, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus Christ agreed in the eternal covenant to say, I will go, I'm, I'll go. I'll go down and I'll live perfectly. I'll keep your law perfectly in the midst of a sinful people. I'll go to be the second Adam because the first Adam sinned the first opportunity he had and through the whole mess into chaos, I will go and I will keep your law perfectly. I will do only what you tell me to do. I will say only what you tell me to say. I will demonstrate to fallen mankind what it looks like to live a life of obedience to the Creator. And in the fullness of time, I will step into the arena of unspeakable agony and I will bear in myself the sin of these people. And I will endure, and I don't know how, but I will endure your wrath for sin. And I will satisfy your divine wrath by suffering and dying in the place of sinners. And I'm confident in you, my Father, that I will rise three days later. I will vindicate everything you've said about sin. I will demonstrate everything you've said about mercy. I will go. The second person of the Trinity Humbled himself, Paul said. He humbled himself. Became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. And Paul said to Philippians, Let this mind then be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being very God, God himself, co-essential, co co-eternal, who being very God, did not think his position in the Godhead was something that he should cling tenaciously, jealously to. But he willingly emptied himself of that role. Taking upon himself the form of a servant. Being made in the likeness of sinful man. This is how the head of God is Christ. There's not a hint. There's not a hint of inferiority there. How often did God break in as recorded in the gospel? This is my son. Oh, I delight in him. Oh, I am well pleased with him. We have to think that way when we see this passage so that we avoid the ditches. We avoid the ditches of this notion of somehow woman is inferior. No. No. Paul said, I want you to understand this. In order for them to receive what he's about to say, they've got to understand that God has an order. And you've got to understand, brothers and sisters, that God has an order for your life and my life, and 
that society is in utter chaos because it absolutely hates God and his order. Isn't it interesting, if you were really, if an atheist was consistent, why would an atheist ever be concerned about God? Why? If I told you I don't believe in dragons, but I spent my life trying to slay dragons, I think I've betrayed something, haven't I? am afraid that dragons exist. And that's the honest assessment of an atheist. That he hates God. And he's afraid God exists. And he will spend his life stomping out any indication that there is a God. And that's what societies do. And it's come to your doorstep, to my doorstep. And it's come to the schoolhouse. And it's come to the state house. We've got to understand what's going on. So, there's this principle of subordination. And we need to learn to embrace where God has placed us. And if you're sitting here as a woman thinking, I don't know that I like where this is going. Hang in there. Hang in there. You're going to get to it. You really enjoy. <laughs> so hang in there. <laughs> Third, conclusions based on woman's subordination. And here's where he comes into the life of the church. Every woman who prays or prophesies with his, with, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Here's the, the you, and volumes been written about. What is the head here? Is it source? Is he talking about where, where man sources from? Is it authority? And I really believe that the answer is yes. It's source because man was created by God. For six days God spoke and it was. And then he said, let us make man in our image. And he scooped up earth that he had created and he molded it the word for one of the words for, for, for earth or ground in Hebrew is Adam and he took what he had molded and he breathed the Ruach and this Adam became a living being with the Spirit. And you can't read that. You can't read that and not think about the resurrected Jesus in the upper room when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They already had the Spirit, that soul that will never die because God took care of that at creation. then they had life-giving power to carry out the mission. In John's story of the upper room after the resurrection, God breathed into Adam. And he became a living being. He had, the, he had the nefesh, the soul, the eternal soul, given by the life-giving breath of God. God is the man's source. He is the man's head. He is the man's authority. Whatever else and whoever else you think you're accountable to, I promise you one day at the Bema, we will be summoned. And we need to, learn, we need to go back to the garden and read that. Eve took the fruit. When God came into the garden, he said, man, where are you? It's serious to be a man. Made in the image of God. And these folks out there, these men who have denied that and try to act like women and are confused about their sexuality, it is an, it's nothing less than an assault upon God. 
paint any way you want to. But he made them at the beginning male and female. And so you have this picture in worship. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his God. He's, he's the uncovered one in creation. God spoke everything else into being. We, we talk about creation by divine fiat. He said, let there be light, there was light. Let there be, let there be a firmament, there was a firmament. Let there be stars, there were stars. Let there be a greater star, the sun. Let... He spoke and he spoke and he spoke and then he spoke into the Trinity and said, let us make man in our image. And he took time to create this being in his image after his likeness. And a man needs to learn his place and stand before God. Uncovered. Then he says this, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Now, so that comes out of nowhere unless you understand what he's talking about in the Corinthian culture. In the Corinthian culture, though, apparently, I wasn't there, but I've read some authorities on this, the, the, the shaven women. Were, were made, they made wives jealous. They made men lustful. And it was all tied to worship of their gods. They were the priestesses, if you please, in pagan worship. And Paul says there is no such reality in the church of the living God bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so she covers her head. And in that day, you could imagine a, a covering over, over the shorn head to take away the obvious shout, I was a temple prostitute. I used to be a priestess in the temple. And you cover that. It dishonors her head. Not so much here the physical appearance of, of what she has or doesn't have on top. But in the source, in the order, because she lived a life, a being made in the image of God, breathing in and out by God's permission with a soul inside of her that would never die, that had she not been rescued, that soul would have spent eternity in the torment of hell. She had lived her life in rebellion to her creator, and now that he has been gracious and merciful to save her by grace through faith, she wants and should desire to demonstrate, I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. I belong to another. Verse 6. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. If she's going to be in with that rebellious attitude, now, let me say, I heard a fellow preach years ago. He was one of these guys that had gone to see. And he, uh, in fact, I met him one time. And he said, are you women out there? This passage says you better have long hair. That woman that wept at Jesus' feet, her hair was long enough to wash his feet with her hair. She didn't have that little dishrag looking hair. I thought, fell out when I heard that nonsense. It's, it's not talking about hair length. Of course, one of these people influenced by him took the occasion one time to point out to me that my dear wife, one of the most humble, uh, submissive women I know, had a hair length that made it questionable as to whether or not she was in submission. I was talking about that. He's talking about a cultural reality that needed to be checked with biblical and theological implications so that there's no mistaking who I belong to. That's, if you want to get to the bottom of what that's, how, I'm, how am I living to demonstrate who I belong to? Am I living as a man under God? It's loving my wife. It's, it's loving God, worshiping God, honoring God, loving, loving others, serving the world to show that I know who I belong to. I'm not my own. Is my wife living that way? Verse 6, but since it's disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover 
her head. Now, folks, it's the easiest, the easiest fix here. Is to pass out scars. Say, there, we did it. But no, you haven't done it. You, you heard the child that said one time, his, his mom and dad said, you're going you're gonna to stand up. Every church, stand up to sing. Got to stand up to sing. Got to stand up to sing. So finally he stood up and he said, I'm standing up, but I'm sitting down in my heart. Physical symbols that are not an expression of an of a internal reality are nothing. They just make a mockery of it. And Paul's going after the heart here. He's, got, he's not going after external symbols. So, so you have to, he's addressed subordination. And then he moves into this fourth thing, the support for this principle. For a man, verse 7, 8, 7, 8, 9, 10. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. That's where Bubba got his notion that man was made in the image of God and woman wasn't. That's a wrong understanding of this passage. What he's talking about is created order. Now, I was, when I was studying in my, in my doctorate, uh, he had a, a doctoral seminar on on God and the rhetoric of sexuality. And we read a, read a liberal uh, feminist theologian who'd written the book. And here's what she said. She said, now we know when we study creation, so she did at least grant creation, that God created in ascending order. And she walks through the different things that he ascended and he said he made man. And then she says, and then he made woman. And he saved the best and the highest for last. So you've got to avoid the liberal feminists and you've got to avoid the bubbas and find out what this is teaching here, okay? Man was made in the image of God. The image of God made he him, male, female, made he him. We told you last week, you passed, passed the animals before him, fascinating to study that. He named every one of them. You talk, you talk about a mental capacity. What does is, what is unfallen man look like? He names every phylum, every genus, every species. And God does this to show man as the image bearer of God in the garden, but he also does this to show man that he isn't complete. There's nothing out there that he can relate to in terms of God's creation that will satisfy him. Nothing was found. That's the account in Genesis. And God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. So he took... Having caused a sleep to come over the man, he took a rib. As one commentator I read years ago said, he didn't take a bone out of her foot, so it would, you get the appearance that, that she was the doormat for the man. He didn't take a bone out of the, out of the skull, so it would look like she, she was the superior to the man. He took a bone out of the rib. Uh, she's a helper beside the man, alongside of him. Not inferior, not superior. And then, in the Hebrew, we won't get into, but, but the sense is that he, she is called something that means she was taken out of man. And we know that in the English, Old English, man and woe man, woe out of. And that was her identification. She gets a new name, which is a precious name later, because she'll be mother of all the living. But here's the picture, that God made man out of dust, and he made woman out of man. And so they're in the order, not, not, the, not the, the meaningfulness, but the order. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man, so that... The head of a wife is her husband. Something that you would not have seen in Corinth in the pagan culture. And by the way, we're not that far removed from Corinth. Something you will not see in culture today. And it, it started out subtle, not so subtle anymore. When we were growing up, we, our kids were growing up, we would read to them the Berenstein Bears. 
Are you familiar with the Berenstein Bears? All right. Have you ever noticed what a buffoon Papa is in the Berenstein Bears? Mama wants to get the kids eating better. Guess who she finds nibbling on the snacks? Papa. I mean, it's, it's subtle, but it's all across the board. The culture wants us to believe that man is nothing but a tyrant, egotistical. He's sort of a necessary appendage to the whole deal. It's an assault upon God, I'm telling you. Neither was man created for woman, verse 9, but woman for man. It's not good for the man to be alone. God makes woman. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So Paul here has brought in something that you cannot dismiss by culture. It's called creation. Unless you're a Darwinist who doesn't believe there ever was a real creation. You see? Destroy the first 11 chapters of Genesis and you're off to the races to write it however you want to write it. But if the first 11 chapters of Genesis are true, then everybody better put their brakes on because God's got his nose in this and he's very interested in what he created. So Paul cites these passages. Look at them with me real quickly. Genesis 1, 26, 27. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the, of the heavens. Some would read that mankind. Let us make, so let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over the, all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created mankind. That would be a good way to understand what's going on here. Look at Genesis 2, 18 to 23. Then the Lord said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Out of the ground, the Lord had formed every beast of the field, bird of the heavens, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living thing, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to all birds, every beast. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God called the deep sleep. Fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, Well, good. Finally have somebody that take care of me. That's not what he said. <laughs> this is at last. At last. I wonder how long it took him to name all the animals. This is at last. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. It was a high, holy, fulfilling moment. And so the rib was taken. In verses 8 and 9, what we have is the established role of woman from creation. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The old order of creation has been transcended in Christ by the order of the new creation. So we're going to we're going to look at that. Hang in there. God willing, we're going to look at that next week and see what Paul goes on to say when he gives a caution about drawing wrong conclusions about God's order. So thus far, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to rise above culture. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to set culture. And I think what's happened is we have been so quiet and so retreating and so timid that we have set the, let the culture set the agenda and it is now wanting to enforce it on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, I'll close with this. 
in life as a parent, in life as a co-laborer, in life as a spouse, in life in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in all of society, the hardest ground you and I will ever have to gain is ground that God had handed us and we surrendered. We've got to take some ground back as the church. Because your children and my grandchildren are going to be influenced by this. Male, female, end of story, ordered by God. And so preacher, I know some women who are living with some awful men. Yeah, I do too. That's why you have things like men's fraternity. It's a verbal taking men to the woodshed. But you see, the rebellion of a man, go read 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7 today. The rebellion of a man doesn't abolish God's precious, merciful, gracious, meaningful order in creation. It is the way that we win the culture. We hold fast. And Jesus Christ died for that arrangement. And he rose again for that arrangement. And he knows that the gospel is most powerfully preached. Go read Ephesians 5, 22 and following, and get to the end of it. This is a mystery, Paul says, talking about male-female relationship. This is a mystery, but I'm speaking about a way to keep women in their place. That is not what he said. But I'm speaking of Christ and the church. The gospel is tied to this. The gospel is tied to this. Lose the definitions, lose the categories, you blur the gospel. And Paul is trying to help the folks at Corinth see that and make their way through it. And since we live in a day that would make Corinth blush, we need to understand this as well. Let's bow together. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we we come to you today in Jesus' name. We look at this, and, and Lord, uh, I'm, as a man.